Wednesday, April 12th, 2023, morning session of the Portland City Council. Please call the roll. Good morning. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Present. Maps. Here. Rubio. Wheeler. Here. Uh, colleagues, before we get to the rules of order and decorum, uh, I would just like to acknowledge the men and the women of the Portland Police Bureau who are at this very moment conducting an operation at 4th and Washington. This has been a particularly problematic spot in the city of Portland. It's my understanding, based on the updates I've been receiving, that that operation is nearly completed and it's going better than expected. But I just want to acknowledge that there were a lot of people who got up very early this morning, many who had to come back on vacation days, all of uh, whom are on overtime. Uh, and this was not a particularly pleasant task, but it was an incredibly important one to recovering the downtown area of our beloved city. So I just want to really start my day and let them know that my thoughts are with them as they carry out this important mission on behalf of the city. We'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony, or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. First up is communications. First individual, please, item 271. Request of Sean Sullins to address council regarding Rosa Parks commemorative artwork and commemorative marker for the Willamette Greenway. Uh, Sean Sullins has canceled their request. Very good, next individual 272. Request of Brian Borello to address council regarding Rosa Parks commemorative artwork and commemorative marker for the Willamette Greenway. Good morning, thanks for being here. Good morning, uh, I'm Brian Borello. Uh, our board chair is Sean Sullins, and she had prior work commitments, so she won't be here this morning, so I'll Fair be enough. quick. Uh, I represent as a board member of the Piedmont Neighborhood Association, comprised of households and businesses within a North Portland community of 2,500 neighbors. In 2006, within the Piedmont, Arbor Lodge, and Woodlawn neighborhoods, the city renamed North Portland Boulevard to R North Rosa Parks Way. In conjunction with this honorific name change and with new traffic signage and new mapping, board chair Sean Sullins and I appeared before city council that year in 2006 to request authorization and funding for a physical embodied acknowledgement of the courage and contributions of a heroic civil rights activist in the form of a commemorative public artwork to honor Mrs. Parks. Uh, specifically, if you look at paragraph six in the resolution number 36445 for the Rosa Parks commemorative artwork, 16 years later, we appear before you again to appeal for your support, not money, in finally making a vibrant, respectful artwork happen. The $12,000 that was allocated has, uh, has already been allocated and is sitting in the coffers of the Regional Arts and Culture Council since 2006. Although Port, uh, Piedmont Neighborhood Association initiated this project, there was never a clearly defined path toward implementation, nor much enthusiasm or assistance from any city agencies to realize the artwork. So we were left to our own volunteer efforts to do the outreach, develop community partnerships, and work with potential artists. On a completely volunteer basis, we tried over years to work with RAC, Regional Arts and Culture Council, PPR, Portland Parks and Rec, as well as PCRI, North Portland Neighborhood Services, PBOT, June Key Delta House Sorority, Ockley Green Elementary School, Portland Community College, Tom Walsh Development, and several local artists, Sam Morgan, Matt Cartwright, Lisa Bates, Sherita Town, Arby Smith, in order to realize the public artwork. 
We have together donated hundreds of hours of unpaid volunteer work dedicated to see this to reality, so here we are again asking you to help us make this happen. We acknowledge that this artwork project should align with the city's developing policies for monuments and commemorative artworks, as well as giving a voice to artists from Portland's underserved populations. We set this project in motion a long time ago and wish to let those who will steward this project to its successful installation know that we will remain available if needed for any further assistance and as a courtesy to please keep us abreast of its progress. This commemorative artwork should be much more than a historical marker or a commemorative plaque and we enthusiastically look forward to the production of a highly visible piece of public art to honor Rosa Parks. We want to see this project done right and for the artwork to make a real statement. So to augment the modest budget, Piedmont Neighborhood Association could likely apply for a grant from the newly reinstated Neighborhood Small Arts Program and from Metro's Community Placemaking Grants. We'd like to thank Mary Jaron Kelly of North Portland Neighborhood Services, who has been a tremendous liaison and advocate for us, as well as Jeff Hawthorne, the Arts Program Manager for the City of Portland, RAC's Public Art Managers, and thanks to Councilman Dan Ryan and his staff, particularly Darian Jones and TJ McHugh, who have been very helpful in moving this forward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan, then Commissioner yeah, I just wanted to thank Brian for being here today, for serving our city on the Piedmont Neighborhood Association. And both Darian and TJ are in the back of the room there, and it'd be great if you connected with them on the way out. We've got to make sure that this gets implemented at least within 20 years of when this um, resolution was passed. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Maps. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Brian and the Piedmont Neighborhood for their work on this important project. I. Um, I'm, frankly, I'm embarrassed that this has taken us about 17 years to get as far as we've gotten. Um, I think I heard that Commissioner Ryan's office is going to take the lead on uh, making sure that we get this uh, project done. So I really want to applaud Commissioner Ryan for his leadership in this space. And um, uh, um, and please thank everyone who reached out to um, council offices on this matter for um, their civic engagement. Uh, we really need people like you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thanks for, for highlighting this. I, I, I share my colleagues' sentiments. This is ridiculous. It shouldn't take this long. And I, someday, not now, but, but someday I'd like to know the backstory on this because there, there's clearly a why here somewhere, and, and I'd like to know more about that. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your work. Next individual, please, item 273. Request of Christian Foster to address council regarding fentanyl issue in Portland and the TriMet system. Welcome. I believe Christian was going to join in person. Is Christian here? Not yet. So why don't we skip to the next individual, 274, please. Request of Dale Hart to address council regarding illegal street camping. Dale, can you unmute? Dale, are you able to unmute? Is he on a phone? Um, no, online. Wait, okay. Something's yeah. happened. There you are. Okay, good. Good morning, Dale. Good morning. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read this. We have thousands of drug addicts living on our streets, thousands of criminals and thousands of citizens with minimal, minimal resources or special challenges. For the past five years, they have demanded two things, to be left alone and to have a legal place to camp. The city has denied them these simple requests and forced them into our neighborhoods and city sidewalks. The council has forced every citizen of Portland to sacrifice their safety and personal freedom while they seek a politically correct solution. Five years is enough. I am demanding that our city council hear the pleas of the citizens and give them what is needed. Take one week, just one, and pick three or more large city parks suitable for tent camping. Spread porta potties and dumpsters throughout those selected parks and be prepared to provide drinking water. Then stand in unity before the people of Portland and declare those parks open for free public camping. Additionally, announce that camping on the streets of Portland ends in 90 days. Do not make any permanent changes to the infrastructure of the parks. Use the same regulations and laws applied at every camping facility in America. 
just enforce them. Use these parks until the new homes and camps can be established. Or tell me now that in 90 days, those options will be fully in effect. For too many years, the citizens have carried the weight of this crisis, watching as millions of dollars were spent without solving the problem. The citizens have no power to control these campers or regulate their activity. The city does. You have had enough time to find the perfect answer. Your failure shows that there isn't one. These broken and desperate citizens have asked for two things, to be left alone and to have a legal place to camp. Open the parks and welcome the campers into your care. As each day passes, give them more if you can. Do not leave them on our streets another night while you plan for the perfect solution. Caring for them is your job, not ours. If you can't do it, step aside so someone else can. This isn't about you. It is about the thousands of citizens stranded on our streets. There is no regulation or law that should be used to prevent the opening of the parks during this hum humanitarian crisis. You must do this for the greater good. For those citizens that will complain and contest the opening of the parks, I would ask, are you making these objections from a soggy tent while cold and wet, wondering if you can survive another day? Or are you warm and comfortable with nothing better to do? Nobody wants to do this. It is the last straw. Please stop sweeping people across our dying city and give them a place to camp. You can do it now. Thank you. And Thank you, Dale. Did any of the other individuals show up yet? Is Christian here? All right, very good. We'll move to the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled off the consent? Nothing has been Please pulled. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. We will be in recess for two minutes until our first time certain at 945. Create a local improvement district to construct street improvements west of Northwest A, third place in the Northwest Reed Drive Local Improvement District. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from PBOT. It concerns the creation of a local improvement district on Northwest Reed Drive. Um, of course, Council has seen this project before, just a couple of weeks ago on February 22nd, 2023. This Council adopted a resolution declaring the City of Portland's intent to create a lid on Northwest Reed Drive. Now today, PBOT is back before this council with an ordinance which details how the Bureau proposes to follow through on council's directive to create this
this local improvement district. Um, let me uh, remind you how we got here. As you might remember, Northwest Reed Drive is a residential street in the West Hills. The purpose of this lid is to improve a section of Northwest Reed Drive. Specifically, this lid applies to the section of Northwest Reed Drive from roughly Northwest 83rd place to the cul-de-sac at the end of Northwest Reed Drive. Um, as you will remember, this road was originally built by a private developer in the 1960s. At that time, this street was not built to city code. One of the reasons why this road was not built to code was in the 1960s, the developer was not able to come up with a strategy for managing stormwater on the street uh, in a way that complied with city code. So, um, the historical record is a little bit unclear here, but it appears that an informal compromise was struck. The developer built a road that did not comply with uh, city code and PBOT declined to maintain this road because it did not comply with code. Um, and for the past 50 years, residents of Northwest Reed Drive have been responsible for the maintenance of this street. Unsurprisingly, over the past half century, this road has deteriorated. Today, Northwest Reed Drive is in very poor condition. In fact, today this road is not salvageable. That's why a majority of residents on Northwest Reed Drive have come together and requested PBOT's help forming mm -hmm. this local improvement district. This lid will remove the existing road, grade the street properly, and construct a new street which complies with current code. These planned improvements will upgrade the condition on the street to the point where Northwest Reed Drive will qualify for maintenance by PBOT. Here to tell us more about this project, we have Andrew Abbey, Local Improvement District Administrator and Project Manager with PBOT. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Andrew Abbey, Local Improvement District Administrator. I really appreciate that introduction, and if I may pay you, pay you a compliment, Commissioner Maps. Um, I think that is the best Cliff Notes version that I can imagine for 40 years of history on uh, Northwest Reed Drive. So you really summarized that well, and um, I appreciate that very much. Um, there are three things upon which I wanted to touch briefly this morning. First off, um, we received no remonstrances against LID formation. Very pleased to report that. Um, first of three items I wanted to cover with Council is the difference between uh, maintenance and a capital improvement. Um, so when I started at PBOT many years ago, I won't tell you when because I don't want to give away my age, but when I started at PBOT many years ago, our uh, asset management backlog was running in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The last time I checked, it's running in the billions. Um, as I just want to reiterate what I said to Council on February 22nd. Um, maintenance operations does not budget for capital improvements. And when you have a roadway that has deteriorated to the point where it needs a full reconstruction that is no longer maintenance, it is now a capital improvement. So I just want to put that into perspective for Council. So the amount of uh, funding that the property owners have agreed to provide on this is equal to 9.2% of our entire maintenance operation budget. So I just, for paving and striping and things of that nature. So I just wanted to put that into perspective that we simply do not budget for full reconstruction of streets and maintenance operations. And I really appreciate the partnership with the property owners. Second thing that I wanted to touch base with council on this morning is asset management. So along those lines, uh, you know, I mentioned that it's no secret to council that the uh, asset maintenance backlog is growing. Um, the way we start arresting that increase in asset management is to do capital projects where we have partnerships. That does not mean that we do LIDs all over the place. We only do them when we're asked to do them. But I can't stress enough, these are the kind of solutions that we have to bring to the table, whether we're talking Northwest Reed Drive, uh, Northeast 47th Avenue, Southeast 80th and Mill, you name it. These are exactly the public-private partnerships that we have to do um, to get a hold of the continuing deterioration in the city street assets. And then third and finally, um, before I turn it over to um, public testimony, I wanted to share with you a concept that I thought might be helpful for council to understand how we bring these um, projects forward. So as of June 30th, uh, 2022, 17.3% of the streets in the city of Portland 
uh, were paved without curbs and 2.8% were unpaved. So roughly 20.1% of streets in the city of Portland, also including Northwest Street Drive, do not meet our current standards for functionality. So if you were to throw a dart at the city of Portland and it were just to land on a street, there'd be roughly a one in five chance that that dart would land on a street that does not meet our current standards. You take the city's population of about 652,000, that suggests that we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 130,000 people living on streets that don't meet our current standards. Again, this is throwing darts, very high level, but I'm just trying to give you an overall sense of perspective. I lost track counting years ago, but at one point, I think I had logged something on the order of 7,000 inquiries around the city from people calling me up to complain about their streets. I'm sure it's up in the 10 to 15,000 range now. I have not brought um, that many LIDs to council. So in my tenure with the city, we've done roughly 80, 80, 85 or so LIDs. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say we probably have, I don't know, 2,500 people out there that have benefited from LIDs since I began my career at the city. So the concept that I want to explain to you is the public engagement funnel. So I get all these phone calls from people around the city that are unhappy with the condition of their street. We have a conversation about the problem they're trying to solve, the cost versus the benefits. Many of those conversations are resolved over the telephone. We typically go to the next step if people are interested of having a property owner meeting. We are very transparent about physical impacts to the property, the cost of the improvement. We winnow those down. In some, some cases, people really would like to have a street improvement, but it doesn't fit their budget. And those are the projects that get winnowed out. We don't move it to the petition phase. They never make it to council. Then we go through a petition process for those that want to go to the next step. In most cases, we only bring LIDs forward if there's majority petition support. I want to tell the council that I was very clear, given the um, contribution that we were asking from property owners, that if there was any pushback on this LID, um, I was not going to recommend that council approve this LID. So we went through the public engagement process. We had two property owner meetings. We went through the petition process. We had a council hearing on February 22nd, followed by a snowstorm, and I'm hoping I don't have a repeat performance for you here today for that. And now here we are, we have no remonstrances based on, uh, against LID formation. So based on that, recommend or that result, I'm recommending that council uh, pass this to a second reading and approve the LID next week. And I'm happy to answer any questions council might have. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions at this point? I believe we have people testifying. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, why don't we go to public testimony? Thank you, Andrew. We have four people signed up. Uh, first up, we have Paisley Jen Burrell online. Welcome. Oh, hello. Hi. Good morning. Um, my name is Paisley Jennifer Burrell, and I've lived at um, 8542 Northwest Reed Drive for 18 years, my family, and over that time we've watched the road deteriorate. Um, as Commissioner Maps pointed out, the city didn't annex the street, so we're one of those um, streets that's um, um, an, in need of um, improvements. Um, there's holes in the street. There's I don't think that uh, yeah we don't have to go into that part. But when when I was um, what we noticed that uh, when the stormwater drainage problem was uh, finally completed by a home that was constructed at the end of the street was when. Um, I went to our volunteer HOA and said, hey, now's maybe a time that we can see if the street will maintain or the city will maintain our street. And that's when I found out that the city won't uh, maintain a street that was in such poor condition or annex a street that was in such poor condition. And that's when I started working with Andrew, Abby, to see what was needed so that we could have the street um, uh, maintained. Um, so I went to work uh, inform to inform our neighbors of the option of, of um, forming an LID with help of Susan Nichols, who's also going to be testifying. She's our current HOA president. And we went to work informing all of our neighbors of what was going to be needed in order to create this LID. We sent out emails, we sent out written letters to the folks who, the couple folks on our street that do not uh, receive email. Um, and we had held several meetings in my backyard, the two that um, Andrew mentioned that he was there for, and then one also that was just homeowners, so we could all just kind of 
vent about the expense and how frustrating it is that we're going to, you know, no one, no one's excited about the expense of it, but we all kind of came to the conclusion that this is the best way forward for our neighborhood. And so um, I believe that the majority of us or all of us are aware that this is going to happen. So far, all of the neighbors that I've talked to are aware, everyone knows um, that this is in the works. Um, and like Andrew mentioned, we had a majority of petitions returned in favor. And so um, I feel confident that this is um, what what's the next step is to ask you to please approve the formation of this LID so that our road can be repaired and maintained. Thank you for your time. I appreciate Thank you. The <laughs> appreciate you being here. Thank you. Next up, we have Susan Nichols online. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Am I there? Yep, you're here. Great. Uh, yeah, I really want to appreciate and echo what Paisley said. Uh, thank you all for taking the time. I want to thank Andrew for his partnering. Um, this has been a heavy lift of trying to bring people up to uh, be in alignment around spending this kind of money that you know no one planned for. And so to have the level of support that we have, the level of partnering that we have, um, uh, just really appreciate you taking the time to hear us out today. Uh, this is this is kind of a must do on our street. And we've tried um, three times in the past to, to either do this ourselves or to partner with the, the city in bringing this um, to bear. And we've not been successful. And so with the amount of effort that I think everyone's put in and to the degree that we have, uh, the amount of support that we have, uh, it would be a great honor if you would uh, partner with us in, in bringing this over the hill and getting our street um, annexed uh, like the rest of our neighborhood. So um, I should have started with, my name's Susan Nichols. I live at 2433 Northwest 83rd Place. And I do have the uh, the wonderful role of being the uh, volunteer HOA president. Um, but just clear that this isn't an HOA effort. This is actually a group of neighbors coming together to do what has to what they have to do for their properties. And so appreciate it very much. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Brad Herner. Good morning, person. Brad. Thanks for being here. So thanks for listening to us this morning. So I live at 8311 Northwest Reed Drive. Um, we've been homeowners there for a couple of years now. Um, and we're obviously strongly in favor of trying to get this uh, street back into shape. Uh, Andrew has been fantastic to work with. Um, obviously, we've tried a number of times over the years to get this done and haven't been able to. Now the street is in very bad shape, I think, as everyone testified to. Um, obviously, bringing the street back into code will obviously help all of our homeowner values. So we have a selfish interest, but we also have another interest. We have another, we have many mm, elderly people that live on the street that require um, ambulance services. We've already had several calls this year. I really worry that the street is going to degrade to the point that we're not going to be able to have emergency services like fire trucks and ambulances to go on the street. Um, so moving forward, we think this is the best way to, to get this done. A strong majority of people have voted to basically tax themselves to the tune of $50,000 per house, which is a lot of money. Yeah. But we would ask you to, to please partner with us and bring it up to code um, and please bring this uh, street into the, the Portland family. Thank you. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Next up, we have Todd Dance in person. Good morning, Todd. Thanks for being here. Councilman, Mayor, uh, thank you for having us. Thank you again, Andrew, for all your diligent work. Um, as they've mentioned before, this has been going on for many decades. Uh, we are new to the neighborhood, but we can see the future as there's new tur turnovers with residents and new generation coming in. Um, that it's time for us to now step up and hopefully take this over the finish line. 
Um, as we had mentioned in the past, um, our concerns are with the, the erosion of the street with emergency services. Mm -hmm. And I had man mentioned about seven weeks ago that um, <clears throat> with the increased uh, weather phenomena we've been experiencing, um, the fact that you know Portland does sit near an earthquake zone and uh, how these kind of things undermine what's going on below the street level. Um, I'd like to just emphasize that that is still ongoing. Um, in the seven weeks since we met last, uh, my little walks around the neighborhood, I've uh, been spotting chunks about this size that have now been displaced from the street. And then as the rains come in as they do and the snow and the freezes, uh, they're getting wider and wider, the ones that were in existence. Um, so in live time, I'm watching this happen on a weekly basis. Um, it's quite fascinating, but um, my concern is that, you know, you know, much like uh, Lincoln Logs, if you take out enough pieces, um, what's going to happen with the other portions that then start sliding and uh, the acceleration of the event of the street just being... Um, unsafe for pedestrians, for uh, vehicles and whatnot. Um, but I hope that uh, the council will see, see the need for this and uh, will approve of finalizing this LID. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, appreciate your being here today. Next up we have Paige Noggle. Good morning, thanks Good morning. for being here. I'm on the other side of the fence. All right. Um, we hear it all viewpoints here. We'll fix it. <laughs> this is crazy. Could, could you could you it. could you sit down and sit also down. Um, if you could just state I your name jump. for the record? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this is crazy. Of all the roads you have, thousands, tens of thousands of miles, to, this is the lowest priority road you've got in the city. There are no potholes. I'm a runner. I run most days of the week up and down that road. I've looked at every square inch of it. There are zero pot potholes, and there is no uh, buckling. Uh, true, it's either going to wear out because of the freezing and the water eventually, that's decades from now, I would guess, just from uh, living there. And the other thing is, I, I would like to know what the vote was, because the other aspect of this is, well, the finest American tradition, if you lose the, the election, there's been fraud. The election was stolen. The problem is here that this turned out, unknown to me, to be a non-secret ballot. Other people knew, at least the yes people knew, that their, what other people's vote was, that by our not voting, we had voted no. Mm -hmm. We got a call from the yes people saying, and they wouldn't have called us if they had enough votes, so it must have been the last few days of the thing, and said, you haven't voted yet, would you please vote for it? And they were kind of the embarrassing position of opposing our neighbors, which is just such a neat neighbor. We want to vote lifetime for, uh, for, for our current president. She is great. She ought to be president for life. But anyway, of all the roads that need to be repaired in this city, this is not one. I, I wish I had pictures. I could show you. The lower reed we're talking about is in such much better shape visually than the upper part, which now has been repaired by the city in the last year, dripping hot tar on big cracks around it. It doesn't look attractive. Our bottom half that we're talking about looks, looks very, very nice. It's much more attractive. I would put this as a very low priority. So if we want to do this, I would say, yes, homeowners, each of you kick in up to a million and a half dollars to repair uh, a couple hundred yards of road, a complete repair. Let's let Mother Nature chew up that road for us, not have machines come in and chew it up, but let Mother Nature chew it up, and then when it really is degraded decades from now, then we can repair it and not have to have machines come in there and chew up this perfectly adequate road. There are no potholes. There's no, I don't know where they get this, this chunk you talked about. It's not on that road. But anyway, uh, and the other thing is, it wasn't a secret ballot, so everybody knows I'm against it. I don't think we had a really any debate about it because the Homeowners Association is so copacetic. They're all so nice, we all like each other. And this has been a divisive issue, and so no one has spoken out against it except me. And, and, and if I'd been aware that this was a non-secret ballot, I'd have been out banging on doors too, because the, the pros did not have the votes, because at the last 
few days of it, they are calling us and say, hey, you haven't turned in your ballot. I'd like to have another vote. <laughs> thank, thank you. And, and uh, just for the record, did, you are a homeowner on the street, is I'm, that correct? Yes. I'm, okay. I'm the bottom one, a little okay. house in the hole. Fair enough. Right? And that's where all the water comes down. Believe me, I, I know what it's like to be on the bottom where everything rolls your way. Uh, <laughs> but but I do, I do. It's that road beautifully about the, the drainage now. It's great. great. There's no problem. Did, did, did you file a remonstrance? I did not. Okay. And, and can you tell us why, just out of curiosity? Uh, lazy. Okay, that's yeah. fair. That's an honest answer. I appreciate I, you. I thought we had. To, I thought we, to, to, we never. I never heard whether which the way the vote went. Oh, and okay. So I said, "Hey, great! It, it didn't happen." And that was another. Thing. It seemed like the, the goalposts got moved. It was supposed. We we're supposed to have our vote in by the end of October, and it seemed like the goalposts got well, maybe the end of November, maybe the end of December. So I don't know when they cut off receiving other votes. But obviously, the people who were voting yes were saying, "Hey, Paige, you haven't voted, please." So they didn't have the votes at that point when they're calling. Okay, me. I think I think I get it. Thank you. Appreciate your being Thank here you. today. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I, uh, Commissioner uh, Maps, ask Andrew to come up real quick? Oh, do we? Do, does that complete public testimony? It does complete testimony. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, of course, Commissioner. Um, just real quickly, Andrew, just, just to clarify uh, the record. Uh, did anyone vote against forming this lid? Do we have any ballots uh, w where someone voted no? Uh, the Revenue Bureau sent out the notice of the LID formation hearing three weeks before today, as required by city code. And we received no remonstrances by the deadline one week ago at 5 p.m. So that is the process that was laid out by city code. I think I heard the self-description of lazy, and that's fine. People can take whatever timeline they want. So I will just amend my remarks that when I stepped to the podium a few minutes ago it was 25 out of 25, it is now 24 out of 25. No objection to forming the LID. So this is democracy in action and it's council's decision whether to form or not form the LID based on 24 out of 25 or 25 out of 25. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have no further questions. Thank you, commissioner. Um, I forgot to one, mention one other thing. We are gonna, if you approve this LID, this uh, LID does have insufficient fire protection and the Water Bureau will fund an additional fire hydrant roughly in the middle of this LID. That, that cost will not be borne by the property owners, that'll be borne by the Portland Water Bureau. I neglected to mention that in my opening remarks and just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. Great, Andrew, I, ha I have a question then, Commissioner Ryan. Um, so when we do this, when, when an LID is approved, assuming this one is, as, as with others, do all city bureaus make sure that there's no additional work that needs to pay, take place beneath the street, like water, sewer? Do, do, do we go through that checklist to make sure that we're not paving a street that then subsequently is torn up again? We try to, Mayor. Um, that is an area of asset management where there's room for improvement. Um, so when I administer all IDs, I try to check for all those things. I do make mistakes. I will tell you when we form the Northeast 47th Avenue LID a number of years ago. I forgot to check that there was no sanitary sewer at the north end of the street and a property owner submitted testimony and this is exactly why we have the process that we do for property owners to provide input. He came into council at the resolution phase, equivalent to what council did on this LID on February 22nd, said, hey, I love the project, but wouldn't it make sense to extend the sanitary sewer? Absolutely, I talked to BES and we amended the LID and included sanitary sewer. So. That, in effect, is what I was doing when I reached out to Water Bureau and Fire Bureau on the, on the fire hydrant. So we try really hard to not miss anything. Um, again, I think there's room for improvement. Um, sometimes the improvements are accidental in the example I just gave you. But yes, we do try to make sure that if we're going to tear up the street, we do it once and we're not cracking open that street again in the future. So I appreciate the really good question, Mayor. Great. I appreciate you. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. <clears throat> I like that question. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to start off by thanking you, Commissioner Maps, for the, for the very quick synopsis. Um, it was very succinct of the history of Northwest Reed and Northwest 83rd. I think when this first came up, I just asked some basic questions. I, I'm a real big advocate for allowing people to age in place and not have you know, government do something that forces them uh, to be burdened with their fixed income. And so I appreciate the dialogue. I really want to thank also Paisley and Susan 
for your leadership and your volunteerism for the people who testified today. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really all I'm doing right now is saying I feel like I've been listened to because I've been harping on this a little bit on L every LID. And so I appreciate the, the feedback that you gave and the updates that you've been given. And also your humility of uh, doing an amendment to your earlier remarks based on the last testimony. Um, anyway, thank you. I think we're on the right track to being really thoughtful about how we move forward. And no one wants to be here. And it's, it's, it's tough. We obviously have conflicting scenarios on what uh, the street looks like. I really don't want to be Judge Judy right now and like pretend I'm going to make a verdict on who's right. But maybe I'll do a little walk myself in that, that area to just see it for myself before we vote. Thanks so much. Cool. And, it's and not, we're not voting today. This is no, no, no okay, first good. reading. <laughs> and Mr. Mr. Mayor, before we um, wrap up on this particular item, I just want to thank Andrew for his work on this project. And um, I really want to thank everyone who came out and testified today. You know, I think this, this is a really uh, classic example of what local democracy looks like. Uh, uh, um, so I appreciate everyone remaining engaged with this discussion, which, um, you know, has gone on for decades at this point. I sure hope that we can figure out a way to come together and build uh, the infrastructure that we need in order to make it possible for you folks to stay in your homes and for us to get fire trucks and ambulances up there. Um, I appreciate everyone's um, collaboration and uh, conversation. And um, again, thank you for coming in today. I'll hand it back to you, Mr. Ray. Very good. Appreciate it. There being no further business on this item, this is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. All right, next up, 276, please. This is also a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Thank you. I'm sorry, this is an emergency ordinance, 276. Amend intergovernmental agreement for earthquake ready Burnside Bridge bridge project between Multnomah County and the city for final design services. Commissioner Mapps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from PBOT. This ordinance authorizes an amendment to an intergovernmental agreement between the city of Portland and Multnomah County for staffing services for the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge project. With this IGA amendment, Multnomah County agrees to compensate the city of Portland for staffing services the city provides to support the final design phase of the earthquake ready bridge. Uh, these costs shall not exceed $3,055,362. This IGA covers the period between January 1st, 2023 and April 30th, 2026. This amendment to the IGA makes no changes to city policies. Here to tell us more about this ordinance, we have Sharon DeLeo, uh, city project manager with PBOT. We have Megan Neal, a project manager for, from Multnomah County. There we see Megan, I think, online. And we have Taylor Steinblock, a government relations coordinator with Multnomah County. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner Maps, and good morning, Council Members. Um, I am Sharon Dalio with PBOT's Major Projects and Partnerships Group and the City PM for Earthquake Ready Burnside Bridge. And it's not advancing. There it goes. Um, our current IGA expired uh, December. 31st, 2022, and so we have requested this emergency ordinance to ensure we are reimbursed for staff services as the county begins the final design phase of the project. There are no project decisions as part of today's council action. Burnside Bridge is a key multimodal connection from the east side with downtown and a successful EQRB project, um, which I should have noted we tend to call this EQRB. Um, it requires engagement from multi-city bureaus. PBOT is the lead bureau for the project and will continue to be the liaison with the county for all other bureaus involved in the project. As the project advances through final design, the city team will be reviewing the proposed project improvements for both temporary and permanent impacts and working with the county to establish mitigation measures. In addition to the East Bank Esplanade and the waterfront in general, Parks and recreation is also particularly key to coordination 
with impacted organizations such as the Japanese American Historical Plaza and the Portland Saturday Market. We will also continue working with the county with regard to council's previous conditions of approval, which is the focus of the next slide. So we last brought EQRB to council in July 2022 when council endorsed the modified locally preferred alternative with conditions. And we noted that as the program advanced to sub subsequent phases of work, per the ter terms of our IGA, we'd return to council. Each council action has acknowledged the consensus on the need to address earthquake resiliency and provided direction on other areas that were critically important. The modified locally preferred alternative endorsed last summer reflected progress in the cost saving efforts the county felt the need to make in order to progress the project. City engagement will continue to inform the project development to prioritize city values, including equity and climate, and prioritizing the non-vehicular modes. When City Council endorsed the modified locally preferred alternative, two conditions of approval were included. One, to maximize the pedestrian and bicycle space on the bridge, and the second, to provide an ADA connection between the bridge and the esplanade. These conditions align with input and feedback throughout the public engagement process, as well as stakeholders, including city committees, commissions, and advisory bodies, and to ensure our local priorities are well-defined, actionable, and specifically to address trends in climate, equity, safety, and mobility. We have been working at the technical and government relations level to outline a process to work through potential solutions to address these conditions along with other concerns that may arise. And now I'd like to turn it over to Taylor Steenblock with Multnomah County, who will share a little bit more about the work plan and process. Good morning, Mayor, Council morning. Members. My name is Taylor Steenblock again. I'm here from the Government Relations Office at Multnomah County. Um, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about this work plan that Sharon uh, mentioned in the last slide. So you can see on the current slide in front of you, the timeline is from about April. So we've already kicked off um, through mid-October. And really the hope is that we can do as much fact-finding, as much information seeking as possible, um, understand the options that are out there to address various different city concerns, and then also really understand what their costs are and work with our technical folks such as engineers to understand what's really possible um, because I think we all know in the transportation space right now it's competitive out there so we really want to figure out how to make this project as competitive as possible and as partnership oriented as possible so that it can be a successful project um, and then when we have finished all of that fact-finding and really kind of try to pick up every rock and look under everyone um, then the next phase will be that decision-making phase which you can see here is outlined um, on the other side of that city County leadership uh, membership group. So um, I know we had a little bit of a conversation yesterday about what that leadership group is going to look like. Right now, it's uh, staff at PBOT, staff in our uh, community services division, which houses transportation. And then when needed, we might engage the various directors for PBOT and for DCS, um, and then potentially also commission staff for both Commissioner Jayapal and Chair Vega Peterson's offices, and then Commissioner Maps's office as well. Um, and that is really what the collaboration has looked like so far. Um, and then once we uh, start looking ahead to the decision-making phase, we will also get very close to um, the final EIS or the record of decision for the environmental phase, and we will already be part way into design. So um, really the project is progressing in uh, tandem with this effort, and we're very grateful for the city to be so collaborative with us on this. Um, I know today we're just ahead of you asking for the IGA renewal, but I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that what you are buying with this ongoing IGA really is collaboration. Um, in a wonderful form. Thank you. Commissioner Gonzalez. Bear with me. And uh, Mayor, please let me know if there's lag on my end and I'll turn off my camera. I just am worried about Wi-Fi where I'm located. Um, uh, thanks for the, uh, the background. Just a, a baseline. So this was originally uh, proposed to be included in Metro's transportation bond back in 2020, correct? I, I'm just reading the proposed ordinance and just trying to level set on how we got here. And um, but is that is that correct? Originally, this would have this would have been funded through the Metro bond, but it did not pass. That is correct. Okay. Um, and um, 
I realize again that we're, pre we're before us is a rather narrow question, but I just wanted to level set on the this, this is an important project for the state from a public safety perspective and a resilience perspective. Um, the county owns the bridge and the city has been contributing to the project for uh, a number is correct or could you level set on sort of how the existing uh, responsibility works and um, financial contributions to the project. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, I can uh, try to answer your question and maybe um, I might have a clarifying question as well. So the, it is a current county project, so the financial responsibility does lie with the county to fund the project. And I think there will be a slide later in this deck that will talk a little bit more about how we're doing that. Um, but I will say that right now the investment we have in the project comes from our vehicle registration fee, which the city very graciously allowed us to increase. Um, and the county does retain the full amount of that vehicle registration fee increase and it does go towards bridges. So it was a tool we used to fund the Selwood Bridge previously and it is a very key part of funding the Burnside Bridge going into the future. Um, right now that funds the project at roughly $300 million and the full project cost um, from the current uh, locally preferred alternative is about 900 million. So it does fund us roughly a third of the way there. Got it. And um, I do apologize. If you, if you have remaining slides, I'm happy to wait until the conclusion of your slides to ask my questions. Again, I, there's a little bit of dissonance uh, that I'm remote. So I will, I'll stand down for now and we'll circle back at the completion of your presentation. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. I'll wait until the presentation's over. Very good. Thank you. Great. So I'll try to go quickly knowing we have some questions to answer. Um, this is the slide that we've been showing on almost every one of our Burnside Bridge presentations. It kind of uh, illustrates the full county, um, I guess vulnerability is the best way to put it. So all of those red dots you can see on this slide are non-seismically upgraded uh, transportation assets. And then the green ones are ones that have been improved. So you can see that Burnside is that yellow line there through the center. And the reason why we picked Burnside Bridge aside from the fact that it's at the heart of the city, um, is really because it does tie our entire county together and it has very few seismic vulnerabilities on it. So we do think that after a major Cascadia event, there's a good chance that we actually could use Burnside Road as a whole with a, with a new bridge to really tie our county together and make sure that we can do both fire um, and water, you know, we can really provide those services in the days just after the event, but then also we can use it to try and recover um, with hopes that our folks um, at ODOT can make sure that the Interstate 5 bridge is also successful. So we will have both an east-west and a north-south connection. Um, and then for the purpose of this project, we've really focused on three areas. Of course, seismic resiliency and emergency response is very important, um, but also regional recovery and rebuilding, as I just mentioned in the last slide, has been something we've also been focusing on. So um, emergency response is one way to design the bridge. Thinking about the long-term use of the bridge is another way to think about the project, which leads me to our third purpose, which is long-term multimodal use. Um, I think our region has done a lot of work to try and take reliance off of single occupancy vehicles. And so we've tried to take that into account as we design the bridge and really make sure that everybody who needs to use this bridge, both today, afterwards, and then also during the uh, event can utilize the bridge effectively. And then here is our slide about timeline. There's also the funding bit below. So as you can see, that $300 million got us from 2016, which was the feasibility study, all the way through mid-2025, um, partway into construction. So uh, the project is funded through the beginning of construction, and we're hoping that as we get closer to construction, we can get additional state investment as well as federal investment. Um, and then this slide uh, is just a little bit more information on the federal grants that we're seeking for the project. We are trying to close that funding gap. Um, we do need about $600 million. It's a tremendous amount of money and with rates changing and bonding kind of being in flux often, um, that's a conservative assumption, but we really are working very hard with our state and federal partners to get this project funded as best as we can. And I'll hand it over to Megan Neal, who is our engineer and project manager. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. I just wanted to close with two slides, just reminding everyone some key components of the bridge that we're advancing into the design phase. So up on the screen now are two conceptual renderings of the bridge that we will be um, looking into more detail. Just wanted to mention that the bridge is largely gonna look like a modern version of what's out there today. 
namely a low profile structure on the west approach, preserving the city views, a uh, bascule style movable span, what's out there, similar to what's out there today over the navigation channel, but there'll be a big change on the east approach. So part of our resiliency uh, design of a component of the bridge, we are looking to span over the highly liquefiable soils that reside on the east bank of the river. So we're looking to have the bridge touch down almost to the skate park. So that long span results in uh, our engineers requiring a lot of structure above the deck, which will be very different than what is out there today. We're looking at a tight arch structure as shown on the left or a cable stay structure that is shown on the right. And just to kind of, um, kind of ex help express how seriously we're taking the seismic resiliency aspect of this bridge, I just wanted to mention that we put a lot of care and attention into developing a highly advanced seismic design criteria, unlike any other on a bridge in Oregon today. Um, we are looking to design this bridge to withstand an earthquake, the largest earthquake in North America, 10 times that, that uh, of the 7.8 magnitude earthquake that Turkey experienced recently. And we're looking to design this bridge to be immediately operable after a major earthquake. So um, even if the bridge is in the open position, we'll be able to lower it down and have it be readily usable, which is unlike any other bridge in downtown Portland, especially if you consider the approaches. Um, we developed this, this seismic design criteria in collaboration with technical experts um, at PSU here locally, as well as nationally. So we're really excited to bring the first seismically resilient bridge to downtown Portland. And then on the next slide, just a reminder of this uh, four lane typical cross section that we are proposing. Um, just wanna mention, I really appreciate the collaboration we've had through the environmental review phase with the city to identify the lane allocation on this new proposed four lanes. Um, I just wanted to touch on that while we did uh, remove one vehicular lane from the bridge to kind of re to reduce the overall project cost, we are still preserving and enhancing elements for all right, that's my daughter knocking on the door. <laughs> Elements for um, bike, ped, and transit users. So as you can see, we are preserving the eastbound bus only lane that's currently out on the bridge today. We're also allowing for an implementation of a westbound bus only lane too, should uh, congestion warrant that in the future. Uh, in those outside bus lanes, we are in including, uh, we are designing the bridge to, um, uh, to carry the loads of a future streetcar line. I'm so sorry. Um, and then moving on to the multi-use path, we are looking at a range that goes, uh, that meets or exceeds the widest multi-use path on any bridge in downtown Portland today, which is the Tillicum structure. And in addition to that, we're implementing a physical barrier between bike ped users and our vehicular traffic just to kind of increase that sense of security and comfort for bike ped users on into the future. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Sharon to take us on into discussion and questions. Thank you. And that is actually our last slide. So thank you again, and we're here for any questions. Great, I think Commissioner Ryan had a question. I could wait if there's public testimony or if you had invited guests. Is there any testimony? Do we have testimony on this item? No one signed up. Okay. I, when you mentioned, hi, thanks. For, that was a great presentation. I didn't hear parks mentioned as being included at the table when you mentioned who would be collaborating. And obviously with the Esplanade on the other side and the skate park that is, um, is a big deal. I was curious why I didn't hear that. Yeah, Commissioner, um, so I think maybe Sharon could talk a little bit more to the internal workings of the IGA, but um, on that first slide, I think she had a list of the various uh, or bureaus that have been involved in this project, and PBOT has been appointed as the lead agency, but it's my understanding that it's not only PBOT who's had input on this process. So. Yeah, that is that is correct. PBOT is the, the lead bureau, okay. however, we just lead the, we are the liaison, and Parks has been very, very much involved. Um, not only in regard to the skate park, but the esplanade and the, the waterfront as well. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we're taking in all of the, their voices because we don't want to delay those projects or ruin these assets or just, I, 
I, I wasn't brought up to speed on this. I, this my, and that's on me. There's been a few other big items. Sure. So this feels, I just need to hear more about parks engagement. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. I have a question. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, you go ahead first, and then I'll, I'll follow up. Can you hear me okay, Mayor? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I just also want to reiterate, and then uh, one aspect, uh, just the essential nature of this bridge from a, a resiliency perspective and the importance of getting this project completed uh, for the community um, and just general observation there. But in terms of the um, decision-making rights, you alluded to it, but I just want to understand a little bit um, how those leadership team meetings are going to work and um, you, you hit on it, but I just want to understand who's represented at the city. Uh, uh, what what are the voting rights? How do we, re, uh, what if there's disagreements on design and what are the decision rights at a high level under the intergovernmental agreement? Yeah, I think he did it towards the beginning. Yep, this is the one, so. Yeah, so uh, Commissioner, I can talk a little bit more about that and I'm welcoming Sharon to uh, pipe in as well, but really the city county leadership meetings are as inclusive as they as anyone has the interest to participate in terms of city staff so um, I can say that Caitlin Ruff and Sharon and Shoshana Cohen um, and then a couple of other folks from Peabot that have dropped into a couple of the meetings we've had already um, as Peabot has acted as the lead agency that's been the primary um, level of involvement with those city county leadership meetings and then on the county side we've got um, some transportation folks our director government relations and our project manager um, and then of course commission staff as uh, they're interested but I'm thinking really um, about the decision making is what I'm hearing that you have the most curiosity about so um, staff is not tasked with making any decisions I want to be really clear that that decision making would happen at the elected level what we're trying to make sure is that you all have the information you need to come to the table with the most information possible so that you can make an informed decision in this space um, so far as it stands with Burnside being a county project and then Portland being a partner agency to that project. Uh, Multnomah County ultimately would be the decision maker for you know, how does the project change, who, um, exactly what do we add or subtract from the project, and do we expand the budget, because we are ultimately responsible for that budget. And then the city, in very um, basic form, would basically decide, okay, do we support that? Do we change... Um, any of the different statements we've made about the project in previous resolutions. Is there any difference in terms of public stance that we want to take about this project? In practicality, though, I would also just note that um, the fact that the project takes place within the city of Portland and the fact that the city of Portland has been such a partner um, while the decision-making authority stands as is, there is definitely a lot more complexity to it than that, right? Like, I think one decision is going to inform the other and vice versa, and much of that uh, information sharing that will happen during that decision-making process will also be very collaborative from one agency to the other. So I want to be clear that while that authority stands um, very formally in those two pools, the process is not going to be um, segmented in that way. It's very much a, a fact-finding mission with technical advisory as well, as you can see in that lower um, bar there and we're all trying our best to just really be at the table and figure out a path forward which is again to why this is called the city um, addressing city concerns instead of um, the title in the prior slide is because we really want to make sure that not only do we address the multi-use path and also the ADA ramp but what are all of the possibilities and how can we be creative to make sure that this project does achieve concerns that both the county and the city have about this project and I think Got it. To, oh I'm sorry Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I will add that um, we're, we're still working through the details of this plan, but the um, escalation process is something we're still working out, and it will really vary depending on the, the item. If it's, if it's an item that we resolve um, to align with you know, our city policies and guidelines and our interests at the technical level, then there may not ne be a need to escalate it. But depending on what those outcomes look like, um, we will certainly be um, keeping Commissioner Mapp's office um, in the loop, and they are very interested in how things progress. And so um, we'll be continuing to work through um, each concern on its own merits. 
Got it. Okay. Um, I'll turn this over to the mayor in one second. I had two last just general buckets of questions on the on the ramp. Um, I appreciate the uh, liquefaction question concerns, um, and uh, they're quite serious, frankly. Uh, if we're trying to really build resilience, How, what are the various ramp options that are being discussed now? Will there be a separate environmental impact statement submitted once the ramp option, it, you know, is chosen? What's just walk me through the process for for um, the, the east, really talking about the east side ramp, um, yeah. you know, dynamics. Yeah, sure. So um, last July, we had um, the city had um, contracted with a consultant to study what the ramp options were, and so um, we at that time um, had several options on the table, but kind of similar to the Burnside Bridge project itself, we recognized the need to do some value engineering, for lack of a better word, um, cost reduction. Um, and so where we landed with a preferred alternative on that is a um, ramp that actually would only connect to the north side of the bridge. And so that's something that we are still working through the details of because it would require kind of repositioning of the space allocation on the bridge itself to ensure that um, pedestrians and bicyclists were on the north side of the bridge and could travel both directions in order to access it. The reason for that um, is twofold. By only providing a ramp on the north side, it actually gets the ramp structure out of the highest liquefiable area that is on the south side of the bridge. And then it results in a more singular ramp structure that also reduces costs. Okay, got it. And that that's leads to my last question. It's going higher level, are there some any fundamental uh, design decisions that will have a material impact on costs. Like, so we wanted to, you know, do some cost engineering um, on project scope. Um, the things that aren't strictly required to, you know, from a resilience perspective, that aren't strictly required from a, uh, that <laughs> just what you need to do to replace a bridge. Where are the bigger, design, you know, discretionary decisions in the current budget? Um, that have material dollar impacts? I think I need to refer to the, the county to answer that question. Yeah, Commissioner, I'm happy to take that one. So um, I think we've already talked about a few cost-saving measures. One of those cost-saving measures was actually to remove a vehicular, vehicular lane from the bridge. Um, we've done a couple of other design things like choosing a girder style on the west end. That also reduces some costs. So we have done some major cost-saving design choices um, already in the process. And then I think as it relates to specifically the ADA ramp that would connect to the East Bank Esplanade, um, um, part of the reason why we need to do this work plan and part of the reason why we need that specific technical uh, group to refer to is because I think what we're trying to work through is, you know, what is the cost of the ramp at various stages in the project? Um, if we were to shift the lanes from one side instead of being centered, does that increase costs elsewhere? We have a lot of really technical questions that we need. We frankly, you know, I think from the policy side of things, um, think that things are a really unique and creative idea, and we want to make sure that engineers agree with us on that and that we don't inadvertently increase costs elsewhere. So um, sometimes this project can feel a little bit like whack-a-mole. When you do one thing, something pops up elsewhere, and so really what we're trying to do is do this multi-month-long process so that we can truly understand what the options are and what the cost implications would be for that. So um, I think it's pretty clear that adding the ramp to the project would increase the cost. The question is how much and what is the overall um, cost in relation to the benefit of that ramp and how can we even those out? Is that possible? Um, and then, you know, as it relates to federal grants as well, is there a way that we can approach the grant process differently um, with the ramp being a part of the project, does that, um, does that slow the project down with the environmental review phase? Does that add costs, but does it make it more likely that we might be eligible for a different grant over here? There's so much research to do around this project that that's why we're really trying to take the time and do this process and just understand the overall impact that it would um, have on the project. All right, I appreciate your thoughtful answers to all my questions. I'm done for now, thank you. I have just a couple. So you have the city county leadership meetings. Who who is part of those meetings in terms of the leadership team 
identified on the work plan. And I think that's going to vary depending on how far we, we need to escalate it. Um, what we've, we've talked about, and we're still talking about this, is that, you know, we'll have the technical discussion, and if we can't come to agreement there, um, it, you know, we've got Office of Government Relations, we maybe we PBOT Director, Commissioner's Office, so we really kind of are still working out the details of <laughs> what that process looks like. Um, but, yeah, I mean, essentially it will depend on where we need to go to reach consensus. Okay. And, yeah. and Mayor, if I may add to you, those meetings are not intended to be decision-making points. We're really just trying to make sure that staff or our elected officials feel very much in the know and understand how that fact-finding progress is happening. Um, so, you know, to the extent that Commissioner Maps as the JPAC member and then Commissioner Jayapal as the JPAC member need to be involved, I think we're probably looking at maybe um, agency level and government relations folks meeting monthly, and then the staff or our elected officials likely being involved maybe every two months or every three months or something like that. Um, just knowing you all have limited capacity, but we want to make sure that you do feel like you understand how the work has been folding. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. It's it's just very obvious based on your presentation, which, by the way, was a very good presentation, so thank you, that there are many, many city bureaus that are potentially touched by this, as well as many interests in the community that are potentially touched by this. And I, I just want to know how we're making the decisions about who is sitting around that advisory table. Uh, speaking of which, you had the ADA issue identified on one of your slides, but it's my understanding no funding has been identified for ADA access. Is that correct? That That is correct. The, yeah. the ADA ramp um, between the bridge and the East Bank Esplanade is something that is not currently in the project, and that's one of the very key items we are going to be um, working to address in this through this work plan and and my assumption is the city of Portland will continue to advocate for that ADA access I assume that that is a priority for the city of Portland yes okay good because I, I share that uh, what are the next or where, where are we with East Bank Esplanade the ramp connections are, are there specific proposals currently under discussion or where do we stand on that um, so we, we do have, from the, the study that the city led, we do have um, several scenarios, concepts that um, we prefer, um, but as far as what the ultimate end product might look like is something that is going to be a key focus of the, the technical focus group meetings and seeing what is um, feasible and then working through, obviously, how that would fit into any funding. And, and my assumption is at some point you'll reach a consensus on what those connections look like? That is the goal. Okay, and then since that was not included in the final environmental impact statement, the EIS, what, what is the process? If a consensus is reached on those connections, how, how does that formally become part of the project given that it's not in the EIS? Can you speak to that? Yeah, Mayor, I think I can talk a little bit to that, and Megan, feel free to jump in with more details, but, um, you know, we are reaching the record of decision for this project. I, it's my understanding that there are a lot of different elements of the NEPA process, and that sea level is one of them, and so actually adding this ramp could potentially raise the water level, um, and so that could actually trigger an additional study for the project. And so one of the things that we'll be discussing in the work plan is, okay, if we were to add it and it were to look like this or this or this, option A, B, and C, what's the sea level impact? What's the other environmental impact to um, shallow water habitat? What, what does that trigger in terms of studies? Um, is there a way that the fact that it's bike and ped infrastructure, can we actually integrate that into the, the EIS we've already done? Does it need to, does there need to be additional work? So these are a lot of the questions we'll be exploring during the process um, because a lot of them are a little bit unclear at this point. Okay, uh, and as this evolves, I, I'd certainly like more, more feedback on that as, as you reach some of those decision points. Uh, construction, design, we're, we're, all, we're all struggling with rapidly rising costs. Are, are there alternative construction or design strategies under consideration to potentially reduce the cost of this project? Um, I could take that one, Mayor. So I think we have already really 
narrowed the project down to about um, as small as it could be without additionally um, harming the daily use of the bridge, frankly. I mean, I think uh, we've removed a vehicular lane and so to remove another one would mean we would only have three lanes on the bridge um, in addition to the multi-use path that's there today. I don't think we would want to decrease the, the multi-use path at all, and so we wouldn't want to take from there, which would mean we would have to take from a traffic lane. Um, we could start running into other complex issues, like can a bus actually fit in the lane on the bridge? There are just a whole lot of things to be considered. So our um, part of the reason why we did the cost-saving measures and why we've been so conservative about a different, uh, a various parts of the project are that we would like to keep it at 900 million for as long as possible. Um, and I can say that because we've been conservative and because we did adopt those cost saving measures, we've been able to keep it relatively low compared to a lot of the other major projects in the region. So we're doing everything we can to keep the project manageable um, and really try to uh, make it possible, I think is the best way I could put it uh, from the funding perspective. Right. And, and it sounds based on, on your response to, to questions by other commissioners that you're, you're keenly aware that there could be some draw on park resources. And so as those uh, resources are identified, I would certainly like to be kept in the loop. And I, I know my colleagues would as well. Okay. Great, that, that answers my questions. Colleagues, any further questions? And again, there's no public testimony, Keelan, on this item. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Ryan. Thank you for the presentation. Obviously, everyone's interested in this because you identified it uh, as a major arterial and one that's so necessary. When newcomers come to Portland, you go, how do you figure out these directions? Well, there's east-west, that's called the river, and north-south is Burnside. What's Burnside? It's this major road with the bridge. So everyone knows this is a major, major arterial. I appreciate the thoughtfulness. You could tell by our questions. We just don't want to be surprised by much needed um, sudden resources from certain aspects of our city's infrastructure. And so I just wanted to make sure that on the record that I, I put that out there for parks with the Esplanade on one side, Waterfront Park on the other, and of course, the skate park. So I will, I will work collaboratively with Commissioner Maps so we're not surprised as we go forward. I just didn't want to have any regrets. So thanks for being here and taking these questions. They'll just keep coming. Everyone's interested. Thanks for your good work. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Super exciting project, crucial for our resiliency. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. You heard from our questions. There, there's so many intersections, bad pun I realize, between this project and, and so many other facets of our city, from parks to ADA to connectors to small business enterprises uh, to other city bureaus. And so I'll just echo what Commissioner Ryan said. This is a project where more communication is probably going to be much better than less communication, just so we all, all understand what the implications and the trade-offs are. Very good presentation. Uh, extremely well done. I appreciate it. I vote aye, and the ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Maps. Sure, thank appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. All right. We'll move to the regular agenda, item number 285, please. Proclaim March 31st, 2023 to be Transgender Day of Visibility. Colleagues, our next item is a proclamation recognizing March 31st, 2023 as Transgender Day of Visibility. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Ryan for our presentation. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and colleagues for joining us today to celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility in Portland. I appreciate the leadership and commitment from Deep Leadership Team. Thank you, Judge Kemp and Valencia Artis. You're all back there gathering. I want to also thank invited guests, Mickey Gillette from Basic Rights Oregon, and also a playwright who currently has a play up and running in this market. We'll talk about that, I'm sure. And Zelos, Zelos Marchant, God, I hope I pronounced your name right, from 10 Tiny Talks for joining us today. I now welcome the city's LGBTQIA2S+. Plus Policy analysis, Lex, Lex Jankowski. <laughs> I usually just call you Lex. Did I destroy yeah, your last that, name? Yeah, that works. All that right. works, Commissioner Ryan. Lex, take it away. It's great to Thank have all you. of you here. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, City Council. Great to be here in person with you all. Uh, my name is Lex Yakushowski. I use they, them pronouns. And I'm the first person to hold a full-time LGBTQIA2S plus policy-focused position at the City of Portland. 
I'm really honored to be with you here today to celebrate the second Transgender Day of Visibility since I've been here with the city. Uh, I want to extend a thank you to Commissioner Ryan, Darian, and the clerk's office for helping coordinate today's proclamation. Really appreciate it. As the first person to hold this role, I drive to support internal and external policy development and also serve as the community's liaison. I feel extremely honored to be serving in this inaugural role at the city and really appreciate council's support for this work's growth within the city. In the last two years, I've uh, seen council really show up to invest programmatic funds into the LGBTQIA2S program, support building cultural competency opportunities for staff, partner with the county to ensure that the joint office supports our transgender community members in accessing uh, services, supporting Cascade AIDS Project and expanding to North Cortland with their PRISM Health Clinic, and also to most recently to fund a limited term position to continue to support this program more broadly. So thank you for all of that support. Um, and we're actually, on a side note, we're in the final stages of hiring for the limited term position to help support the program. So yeah, thank you again for that. As a new program, I continue to identify opportunities for development uh, and I'm grateful for the Queer Alliance Deep Group, many members who are here today with us, as well as Portland's larger queer community for continuing to highlight the myriad and mountain of challenges um, specific to the transgender community in housing, workforce, education, public safety, and healthcare. I'm here today alongside leaders from our community and the Queer Alliance Deep Group to uplift and honor Transgender Day of Visibility, which technically was on March 31st. We're a little bit late this year. Today we celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility amid a torrent of anti-transgender legislation across the country. It is imp more important now probably than ever before that we as a city affirm that Portland is in solidarity with our queer community and specifically is in solidarity with our transgender community. So with that, I'm gonna pass the mic over to some of our community leaders and deep group leadership um, to run us through the program. But thank you for your time thank this morning. Thank you, thank you, Lex. Uh, greetings, counselors. My name is Mickey Gillette. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm the Major Gifts Officer at Basic Rights Oregon. Thank you for recognizing Trans Day of Visibility at the City of Portland again. The International Trans Day of Visibility was founded in 2009 by activist Rachel Crandall, who was dismayed that the only event recognizing the trans community was Trans Day of Remembrance, an annual vigil memorializing those lost to anti-trans violence. In 2019, I approached Mayor Wheeler's office with the request of recognizing Trans Day of Visibility at City Hall through a proclamation. Uh, with the support of Serafie Allen and Aja Blair, we were able to make this a reality, and it's since become an annual tradition for city employees and community advocates to come together and uplift the needs of the trans community while providing space for a policy ask of council. Over the years, we've uh, appreciated the responsiveness to policy asks, like the passage of trans-specific funding for homeless services. Unfortunately, as we meet here today, state legislatures across the country are passing hate-fueled draconian laws prohibiting adolescents from accessing the life-saving gender-affirming care prescribed to them by their physicians. This is care recommended by the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Pediatric Endocrinology Society, and every other medical board that's reviewed this practice. Laws like these aren't meant to serve the best interest of trans youth. They're an authoritarian, authoritarian attempt to return the country to a time when the law itself kept trans people from living authentically. There aren't two sides to the issue of trans people's existence, though. We exist, and we're asking the council to build on the steps it's taken toward weaving LGBTQIA2S plus equity into the fabric of the city. Last year at Transia Visibility, we asked for a commitment to institutionalize this equity work into the city's structure. Since that time, Lex has worked with community organizations like Basic Rights Oregon and the Q Center and the queer city employees <laughs> to craft an LGBTQIA2S plus strategic plan that articulates the work of the program 
at the city and demonstrates what it would look like to see LGBTQIA 2S plus equity across all city bureaus. This strategic plan speaks directly to the ask we made of council last year. Portland is a haven for trans people. At Basic Rights Oregon, we hear from trans adults and parents of trans children who are uprooting to move here in hopes of finding safety and acceptance. Some of them have the means to do so. Some start with nothing because they feel they have no choice. The commitment outlined in this strategic plan is a way the city can show that the trans community is valued. So we're here today to ask for your continued engagement in this strategic plan and to affirm the steps contained in it. In this moment, it couldn't be more important to move this work forward and ensure that LGBTQIA 2S plus and trans equity are a part of the way we do business at the city. And now we'll hear from Zelos Zelos Marchand. Thanks, Mickey. Thank you, Council Mayor. My name is Zelos Zelos Marchand, and uh, Zelos for short, that's fine. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his, and they. I'm the founder and artistic director of TNA Grand Theater, um, a member of the Black and Beyond the Binary, um, and a board member of the Black Advisory Business Council on the West Side. As Mickey pointed out, this year has been incredibly dark for trans and non-binary people and gender expansive people and two spirits in our community. But despite being villainized, transgender and expansive folks, we continue to add so much to the fabric of our communities as we have for thousands of years. For the commissioners who were on the dais during last year's TDF proclamation, you will remember Mickey, Ian, Alexis, and myself sharing about the transgender community's unique challenges on behalf of the larger Transgender Day of Visibility Committee. You will also remember our ask for your commitment to continue to build LGBTQIA plus and transgender equity work at the city. We were so heartened by the council's reception to this ask and commitment to continue building this work at the city. And we have been excited to see the movement that has come from that ask in both an additional limited term position to support LGBTQIA 2S plus programming, as well as the development of an LGBTQIA 2S plus program strategic plan. There is so much opportunity in the passage of this strategic plan to serve as a model for other cities and counties who are just in the initial stages of building out their LGBTQIA 2S plus equity work. The group of folks who have been involved in TDEV in years past are so thrilled to see this plan moving forward, provide feedback, and will be anxiously awaiting to support it when it comes to council later this year. With that, I would like to pass it to Judge Kemp from the city's Queer Alliance Deep Group. Thank you, Zellos. Good morning, commissioners, good morning. mayor. My name is Judge Kemp. I use he, him pronouns. I am a program coordinator at PBOT, and I am the newest member to join the Deep Queer Alliance leadership team. I'm here today speaking on behalf of the over 200 city employees who are part of our Queer Alliance Affinity Group in support of today's Transgender Day of Visibility Proclamation. I'm also here to show my support for my transgender friends and community members who are continually attacked for living their lives. The city has within its networks the Diverse and Empowered Employees of Portland Group, or DEEP, that represents the various cultures and racial demographics of our employees. The Queer Alliance was one of the first DEEP affinity groups to be established in July of 2008, and currently has a membership of over 200 employees. Members of the group represent multiple bureaus and are often well positioned to flag bureau-specific issues that need policy attention. The group has always worked to center policy that specifically addresses equity for transgender and non-binary staff. Some of the group's accomplishments over the years include advanced transgender healthcare for city employees in partnership with Mayor Adams' office in 2009, the group also worked on all user restrooms and gender neutral policies, including advocating for pronouns in citywide email signatures with the late Commissioner Fish in 2015. 
Unfortunately, more institutional support is needed. The work will not continue to grow at the necessary pace without it. This is why the Queer Alliance was vital to advocating for the LGBTQIA 2S plus policy analyst position, as well as the quarterly LGBTQIA 2S plus policy focused meetings with Commissioner Office Liaisons. In closing, we thank all of you for your commitment to assigning a liaison to engage with these quarterly meetings and have been happy to hear support for the growth of the LGBTQIA 2S Plus program and strategic plan that works to address many of the pain points of the queer, trans, and non-binary employees. So thank you, and with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Valency. Good morning. My name is Valency Astris, pronouns they, them. I'm a civil engineer working for the Portland Bureau of Transportation. I joined the Queer Alliance leadership team in early 2021. Over the last two years, I have read emails and taken calls and sat in rooms with our members who are sad and scared and exhausted as we endure the relentless and intensifying attacks on our community. And I've also been setting the agendas for and facilitating many of our monthly meetings run and shared out our surveys, organized social events, co-authored the Pride Proclamations, and helped administer our team's channel and mailing list. And I've had the great privilege of working directly with Lex on all of these things. Lex has been wonderful. They are a consummate professional, quick-witted and well-informed, empathetic, and a tireless advocate. They've been our first institutional support, inviting us to assist in crafting the strategic plan and other policy and also being a person we know that we can trust with the issues most important to us. The Queer Alliance Deep Group is aligned with Basic Rights Oregon, the Cascade AIDS Project, and the Q Center in supporting the first strategic plan for LGBTQIA2S plus issues in the city's history. The plan also has support from our friends and peers in city labor unions. This strategic plan sets up a framework for advancing city culture and city policy, labor development, community engagement, and demographic data being counted and being visible. We have the potential to make the city a more inclusive place for not just queer and trans Portlanders, but for everyone who lives, works, and visits here. And changes that happen in Portland can have regional and national effects that extend far beyond our city boundary. A major focus of the plan reflects the priorities that have been identified by deep group members over the years. City employees have been asking for city forms, both internal and external, that allow people to accurately and correctly identify themselves, and for city equity managers to weave LGBTQIA 2S plus equity into their bureau-specific plans. Adopting this plan this year, ahead of charter reform and bureau realignments and all the vagaries of national politics, is a bold, proactive step in realizing these basic fundamental needs. A 2021 nationwide poll estimated that about 6% Portland's residents identify as part of the LGBTQIA2S plus community. This is the second highest percentage of any city in the US. So it makes sense that with the development of this strategic plan and the expansion of the LGBTQIA2S plus policy office within, within the Office of Equity and Human Rights, we are moving closer to jurisdictions like San Francisco, Santa Clara, Philadelphia, Boston, and Washington DC, who all have multi-member offices of LGBTQIA2S plus policy advancement. Finally, our affinity group, along with Lex and queer folks across the city, have been working on policy recommendations to address gaps for city employees whose family structure may look different and addressing the harm being done to trans communities across the nation by creating safety here in Portland. We hope that we can count on your support for the strategic plan and for bringing forward policies that affirm and provide safety to our queer and trans community. Thank you for your time and consideration. And now my favorite part. <laughs> Whereas transgender, transfeminine, transmasculine, non-binary, two-spirit, gender expansive, gender queer, agender, people have always existed and made important contributions to their communities. Whereas transphobic cultures, including that of the United States, continue to suppress the existence and contributions of transgender and gender non-conforming people, 
And whereas transphobia requires disparities negatively affecting transgender and gender non-conforming and expansive people in health, housing, employment, and all major aspects of life. And whereas white supremacy, ableism, anti-blackness, misogyny, and transphobia are interconnected and depend on the continued violence against black, indigenous, and other people of the global majority who are transgender or gender non-conforming and expansive, particularly black transgender women and femmes. And whereas houselessness and housing services, providers consistently fail to provide safe, welcoming, and knowledgeable support for transgender and gender non-conforming people experiencing houselessness. And whereas among cities in the United States, Portland is home to the second largest percentage of LGBTQIA plus people per capita, including transgender and gender non-conforming people. And whereas the city of Portland strives to make our community safe and empowering for its transgender and gender non-conforming residents, and whereas the city has not yet succeeded in this endeavor, and whereas visibility for transgender people is complex and nuanced and should not be a precondition for justice, and whereas Transgender Day of Visibility is an opportunity for the Portland City Council and the city as a whole to recommit to partnering with the community to address our challenges and in investing in city infrastructure that furthers this work together. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim March 31st, 2023 to be Transgender Day of Visibility in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you all, and I, I know my colleagues on the council and I would like to share a few of our thoughts in response to your, your very heartfelt uh, and much appreciated presentation. I'll start in the order I received them. Commissioner Ryan, it looks like you're up first, then Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Maps, you must have went in and out. <laughs> yeah. You're co you co-sponsored this, so oh, I, I That's quite of you. Yeah, well thank you, mayors, uh, and thank you to all of you who showed up today. That was a beautiful presentation. I wanna start off by just um, saying it was, it's more important to hear your words than ours and I'm really impressed with your courage. I'm honored to, do, to, of course, declare this day of visibility, and it's really a day every day. Um, I, I said last year, I'll say it again, we, we don't get to choose or decide another person's gender identity. Um, we have never been able to, and the world in which people thought they had the privilege to do so is over. And then sometimes I, on this journey, I'm like, what do I know? I'm like a, an old a cisgender white um, gay man. And uh, this journey for me has, has been that as well, a, a journey. I remember, um, God, I do feel old when I make comments like this. I remember being part of the queer movement and always adding another part to the, to the table. And I've always been proud of our community for not um, pretending we don't need to do that. It's just always been about inclusion. And, and what do I know? I know what it's like to be beat up for being myself I know what it's like to be rejected from communities, from jobs, from um, for many decades. I know what it's like further to come out as somebody that's HIV positive. I know what it's like to go through my own journey of why um, I want to uh, straddle my pronouns with adding they. My dominance he, but I add they, because you gave me language. This movement gave me language. I didn't have it when I was going through my many layers of coming out. So I'm just so grateful that we continue to have the dialogue and continue to open up. I'm so proud to be a Portlander most days, but especially on a day like this where I'm reminded of the population base that's here, but to hear you all talk about we're a safe haven for people to, to literally feel safe, to be themselves, and to then to add so much to our community. I've had the pleasure and the challenge why is it a challenge? Because um, watching a friend go through their coming out as a trans has always been fascinating to watch. I've been in those awkward dialogues where I have to remind people there's gender and there's sex, sexual preference. They're not the same thing. And I can only imagine how exhausting that is uh, for all of you. So I'm always an ally and also a participant. And I'm grateful to be on this council at this time to have all of you come forward and be yourselves. And I love all the flags, so I hope at the end we can do some <laughs> sort of a flag thing. And pick, there you go, do the flag. Yes. If you want, we'll do the flag thing if you want. How beautiful, <laughs> all right. Mayor, let's make sure at the end we have a, a moment with all of this. 
Anyway, I had prepared remarks and I stopped looking at them a while ago, but I just wanted to say I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the clamped. And in honor of my spouse, who's taught me a lot as their gender fluid um, over our six years now of being in relationship, I know that's really deepened my journey as well. Mm. So anyway, thanks to all of you for being you and for being visible, for being proud, and for also bringing some joy to the council chambers today. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, I am honored to join you in declaring March 31st, 2023 to be Transgender Day of Visibility here in Portland, Oregon. On that day, we come together as a community to reaffirm our commitment to fighting for equality and prosperity for our transgender friends and neighbors. And on Transgender Day of Visibility, we recognize the work that still needs to be done. Transgender Portlanders face a shocking amount of discrimination. Here are some hard truths that hold true even here in Portland. Black transgender women are the most brutalized people on this planet. Members of the transgender community suffer from high levels of domestic violence. Members of the transgender community suffer from employment and housing discrimination. They're more likely to find themselves homeless. They are more likely to suffer from hate crimes. And our health system continues to fail our transgender friends and neighbors. Portland must do better. And that's what Transgender Day of Visibility is all about. And that's why I'd like to take a moment to recognize and celebrate the people and organizations who are helping Portland's transgender community thrive. Let me start by expressing my appreciation to the community members who shared their powerful testimony with us today. So thank you, Zalos Zalos. Thank you, Mika Armiki. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Valenci. And thank you, Lex. This council is committed to working with you to bring stability and dignity to Portland's transgender community. Now, just a few years ago, Portland's LGBTQIA plus community came to this council and requested that the city of Portland create a position specifically dedicated to addressing the needs of Portland's queer community. And today, that position exists within the Office of Equity and Human Rights and is filled by our capable colleague, Lex, who is doing great work, but there is more great work to be done. That's why I am excited to see and receive the strategic plan that Lex is working on. I encourage Commissioner Ryan, OEH, OEHR, and Lex to bring that strategic plan to this council as a report so we can review it and comment on it and lift it up. Um, I would like to close today by saying this. On this transgender day of visibility, this council sees our transgender friends, neighbors, and colleagues, and you look like Portland. Colleagues, for these reasons and more, I'm proud to join you in declaring March 31st, 2023 to be Transgender Day of Visibility here in Portland. Thank you, Commissioner thank Maps. You, Commissioner, Commissioner Gonzalez. I just wanna thank you all for who you are and everything you do for our city. Uh, we are committed to making and keeping Portland safe for our transgender friends and neighbors. Even if other places and people don't respect or cherish you, we do. We see you, your courage, and everything you bring to our community. Portland and Oregon will always be your allies. Again, thanks so much for coming today and being here, being present, and doing all you do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And colleagues, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the presentation today. I appreciated it last year and I'll appreciate it next year as well. Thank you for the, the hard work you put into it. Uh, I appreciated all of our presenters, but it's appreciated uh, especially for me to be able to hear what our employees are saying, what our city employees are saying. And uh, the most important thing I can say to you is I see you and I support you. And this council will continue to see you and continue to support you. There's more we need to do. I think as we heard today, uh, there, you know, we, we've set a bar and we have achieved much, but there's much more that we need to do. We need to do better, we must do better, and we will in collaboration with you and with the community at large. So I just wanna say how much I appreciate this presentation. Uh, there's courage, 
being demonstrated here, and not just to those who presented, but all of you who are here. And we respect you, and we appreciate you, and we thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should we get a photo or something? Yeah. I mean, with I, I sort of agree with all the, the yeah. flags and everybody here. Let's <laughs> may, maybe in front of the table, if we could just gather there for a minute. We'll be in recess for two minutes.
in session. The next item, please, Keelan, is item number 286, also a proclamation. Proclaim April 9 through 15, 2023 to be Public Safety Telecommunicators Appreciation Week. Colleagues, the next item is a proclamation recognizing April 9th to 15th as Public Safety Telecommunications Appreciation Week. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Gonzalez. As a commissioner in charge of the Bureau of Emergency Communications, it is my distinct honor to recognize the people who are the first first responders. They are there through extreme weather, 24-7, 365 days a year, taking calls from the community and getting the right response where it's needed. Every year, the second week of April is set aside to celebrate the tireless dedication of public safety telecommunicators. That is our 911 callers and dispatchers. They are heard but very seldom seen and this week we have the great privilege of celebrating the hard work that's happening even as I speak. To the public safety telecommunicators of BOAC, thank you for your ongoing dedication to the community and for the continuous hours of training and recertification. I know that the past few years have not been easy with call volumes increasing and this, the, the com concerns on our streets but you have remained steadfast and been a calm voice for so many people on the worst days of their lives. And to the class of 16 trainees, please know that your community needs you, Portland needs you, and we will continue to encourage you and celebrate you when your training is complete. Stay strong. I also wanna take this time to thank BOAC's director, Bob Kazi. Bob, thank you for your leadership and continuous advocacy on behalf of your bureau. With that, I am happy to celebrate National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, and I'll pass it to you, Bob. All right, thank you. Good morning, Mayor Good morning. and Commissioners. Uh, I'm Bob Kazi, Director of the Bureau of Emergency Communications. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you for this opportunity. As we celebrate National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, I want to recognize the 911 call takers, dispatchers, operations, and support staff at the Portland Bureau of Emergency Communications. I'm so proud of the incredible work that they do each and every day. They're a team of dedicated professionals who truly care about our community. A colleague of mine recently said, the individuals at the consoles represent the best of us. It's important to take the time to acknowledge and celebrate their life-saving work, the life-saving work of these heroes under the headset. National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week reminds us to appreciate these professionals who have accepted the challenge to serve our community with diligence, dedication, and courageous resilience. And now, Mayor Wheeler, back to you. Before I, I uh, turn this, or uh, read the, the proclamation, I'd like to open this up for my colleagues to make some comments. Commissioner Maps, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, colleagues, I'm delighted to join you in declaring April 9th through April 15th, 2023 to be Public Safety Telecommunicators Appreciation Week here in Portland, Oregon. This proclamation resonates deeply with me. As you all know, for my first year, two years on this council, I had the honor of serving as the commissioner in charge of the Bureau of Emergency Communications. Now, in that role, I got to see the critical role our emergency communications operators play in delivering public safety services to those who live, work, and play in Portland. Our 911 dispatchers are truly our city's first first responders. Our 911 dispatchers work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Our Portland 911 dispatchers respond to about 1 million calls a year. And many of those calls represent pleas for help from people who are in the middle of the worst day of their lives. I will tell you the truth, I am still haunted by some of the calls that came through to Bowick when I was the commissioner in charge of that bureau. I still think about the child who was hit by a car while riding her skateboard on Christmas Day. And I still think about the hostage situations that turned out tragically. 
And they still think about this fact. Even on our darkest days, our staff at 911 have always stepped up, leaned in, and came through for the people of Portland. Which is why I'm glad to have this opportunity to thank our staff at 911 for the service they uh, provide to our city. In addition, I want to congratulate our 911 dispatchers, Director Kazi and Commissioner Gonzalez, for bringing down our 911 call wait times dramatically. For example, in February of 2022, our average call wait time on 911 was 66 seconds. Now, a year later, in February 2023, our average call wait time for 911 fell to 47 seconds. So in the space of just a year, Bowick got 29% faster at responding to our community's emergency calls. That is amazing. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much, Bob. I know the leadership role that you played in making this happen. Thanks to uh, Commissioner Gonzalez for keeping that going. Thanks to the folks over at 911 who are answering calls at this moment uh, um, and doing better every day. I could not be prouder of Portland's first first responders, which is why I'm delighted to join this council in declaring April 9th through April 15th, 2023, to be Public Safety Telecommunicators Appreciation Week here in Portland. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you for bringing this forward, Commissioner Gonzalez, and also to you, Commissioner Maps, for your leadership over the, over the division. I, it's really good to see you, Bob, uh, Director Kazi, sorry. And I wanted to actually underscore uh, the good news I heard yesterday about the call times um, going in the right direction. There's a lot of momentum. I think I was visiting when you were at the peak of it being in a, a anyway, we knew that we had nowhere to go but up and you were on it and you were hiring and it was one of the most insightful, I love doing field trips, insight uh, visits, if you will. And I was so impressed with how difficult the job is. I always thought it was difficult, but to watch somebody managing the call, managing the technology, having the right instincts, um, like every first responder, you have to just hope that at any given moment you're making the right decision. And it's so easy for people to criticize um, how those decisions are made, but I always ask them to put themselves in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And so all I saw was professionalism uh, and a lot of support from you as a leader for bringing that culture uh, together. They were getting um, criticized, I think, unfairly, and it was wonderful to see the moment. You could feel it was gonna get better, and I just wanted to acknowledge your leadership and all of that. Anyway, it's an honor to be here today to acknowledge public safety, uh, let's see, first respond, public safety telecommunications uh, uh, say week. Uh, is it month or is it week? Week. It's, in it's every day. But anyway, it's just great to take a moment and acknowledge your good work and your team. So congratulations. Thank you. Well, I, I want to add my thanks to that, which you've already heard from other members of the council. This is an extremely difficult job, and it is very stressful. Those are sort of the two components that I note the most. And also, the work that they're doing, the triage work that they need to do, requires nearly instantaneous decision making, and the consequences are literally nothing less than life or death. It's a tough job. It's not for everybody and I really appreciate the people who are doing that. I know that the work that, that our BOIC employees do each and every work, it's, it's critical to how we function as a city. We also know that the job has gotten much more difficult with time through the large surges in 911 call volume during the worst times of the COVID pandemic. BOIC employees were there when people in the city of Portland needed them. That was an important aspect of their work. The work that they do is truly exceptional. And as my colleagues have said, the results show that. And so the least we could do is read this proclamation into the record, but it is heartfelt. Whereas emergencies requiring police, fire, or medical services occur at any time, and whereas prompt police, fire, or medical response is critical to the protection of life and the preservation of property, and whereas Public Safety Telecommunicators in the City of Portland's Bureau of Emergency Communications, BOIC, are the first contact for our community's calls for help for emergency services. And whereas, BOIC Public Safety Telecommunicators are professionals of the highest caliber with expertise in police, fire, medical, and Portland Street Response Dispatch Protocols. 
and whereas BOA public safety telecommunicators monitor first responder radioactivity, thus ensuring their safety while providing a vital link of information. And whereas BOA public safety telecommunicators have weathered historic increases in 911 calls, answering 642 105 calls in 22, and whereas BOA public safety telecommunicators consistently display professionalism, dedication, and commitment. And whereas, we're grateful for the important and often life-saving work accomplished by BOIC Public Safety Telecommunicators. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim April 9th through 15th, 2023, to be Public Safety Telecommunicators Appreciation Week in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this week. I want to thank all of you. Director Kazi, thank you for your continued outstanding leadership. And if you could pass it on to your whole team. Um, you know what, I'd, I'd actually like to tell them in person. I, I hope yeah. with the commissioner in charge's forbearance, uh, I will have the opportunity to tell them myself how We'd much I appreciate it. the work they do. Thank We'd you. Thank you. I'd love to have you there. Next up, item number, 287, but we're going to read 287. Actually, you know what? Let's let's take a 10-minute break because yeah. we're we're into the thick of the, the regular agenda now. We've got some big items coming forward. Uh, why don't we take a 10-minute recess? We will reconvene at 1148. We're in recess.
session. Keelan, could you please read items 287 and 291 together, please? Item 287, authorize contract with Northwest Infrastructure LLC for the O'Brien Square demolition project for an estimated cost of $4,529,090. Item 291, waive 120-day demolition delay requirement for O'Brien Square demolition project. O'Brien Square has deteriorated to a point where the site presents a threat to public health, welfare, and safety. The first item authorizes an emergency contract to demolish the surface plaza and underground parking structure at O'Brien Square. The property will then be backfilled to match the grade of the surrounding streets. The second item waives the 120-day demolition delay requirement within the zoning code. The purpose of the demolition delay requirement is to provide time for the city to consider alternatives such as rehabilitation, reuse, relocation, or salvage. Rehabilitation, reuse, and relocation are clearly not applicable to this site. The Parks Bureau has requested that an informational plaque attached to the former bus shelter be salvaged. The Transportation and Water Bureaus did not identify any additional salvageable pieces. I'll hand this off to our Chief Procurement Officer, Biko Taylor, and Grant Moorhead to provide an overview of the two items. Welcome, Biko and Grant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council. For the record, I am Biko Taylor, the Chief Procurement Officer. Um, in December 2022, P Peabot leadership decided that the O'Brien Street structure met engineering criteria for emergency demolition due to structural integrity concerns. On December 12, 2022, it was declared an emergency by the PBOT commissioner. After collaborating with procurement services to review legacy contractors that could perform this work on short notice, PBOT selected Northwest Infrastructure LLC to complete the demolition work. Northwest Infrastructure LLC is a state certified minority owned business, African American owned, and was awarded a contract of $4.529 million. 96.8% of this contract will be performed by Northwest Infrastructure. 100% of this work will be performed by African-American male contractors. Northwest Infrastructure is located in Portland, Oregon, and as a state of Oregon certified minority contractor, they have a current city of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. That will complete my procurement portion of this testimony. Um, I'll invite Grant Moorhead to provide additional um, context on the historical site and other technical questions. Thank you. Mayor, commissioners, thank you very much. My name is Grant Moorhead. I'm with Peabot's Parking Operations Division, uh, specifically addressing item 291. This ordinance will waive a portion of the zoning code that establishes a 120 day delay period for demolition projects involving structures that are listed on the historic resource inventory. You can advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. The demolition permit for O'Brien Square is now under review and passage of this ordinance will expedite permit issuance. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good. Short to this point, gentlemen. Uh, colleagues, any questions at this particular juncture? Keelan, do we have public testimony on either 287 or 291? No one signed up. Very good. These are both emergency ordinances. Seeing no further questions, please call the roll on 287. Ryan. Thank you, Director Taylor and Grant. Thank you for your presentation. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Uh, I just want to take this time uh, to address this is long overdue uh, for our city uh, and I want to acknowledge the private sector's focus on the square, their commitment to it, uh, led by Tom Kilbane at Urban Renaissance Group uh, that have been doing their parts for years uh, and by offering to put private dollars to contribute to this demolition rebuild. For, uh, with that, I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. Thank you. The ordinance is adopted to the second item, Ordinance 291, also an emergency ordinance. Is there any further question or discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. 
Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Thank you, both Grant and Biko. Uh, we will go to 288. 288 is the second reading. We've already heard a presentation and had opportunity for public testimony. Any further discussion on 288? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Oh, sorry. Aye. Sorry, Mayor. Would you like me to read the title? Yeah, I guess you have to, right? Yeah. yeah I, I don't want you to fight with the lawyer right next to you. That would be very uncomfortable and awkward. Thank you. Uh, 288, amend contract with PTG Oregon LLC, DBA Premier Truck Group of Portland for the purchase of vehicles to extend term and increase not to exceed amount by $40 million. Very good. This is the second reading. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. 289, also a second reading. And my guess is you want to read the title before I jump ahead. Sure. <laughs> approve findings to authorize an exemption to the competitive bidding requirements and approve use of the alternative contracting method of progressive design build for the Inverness Force Main <coughs> System Replacement Project. I love Keelan Subtlety, by the way, colleagues. I mean, that, that was about the most gentle way she could possibly have said, you know, we haven't even read the title <laughs> yet. <laughs> She's good. I appreciate you so much. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I'm really happy to move this project forward. It's a little bit in the weeds, but I'll tell you it addresses probably the largest structural vulnerability that we have at, in our infrastructure over at BES. I want to thank uh, my colleagues for supporting uh, moving this forward. I vote aye. Wheeler. Happy to support it. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item number 290, also a second reading. Authorize competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Selwood Sanitary Sewer Extension Project for an estimated amount of $7,400,000. Colleagues, any further business on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted, and Keelan, that completes our business this morning. It does. We're adjourned until 2 p.m.